the way I think habits function, this is just, these are my ideas, is that because it's such an energy hog, it wants to be efficient. So this whole myth about you only use 20% of your brain, no, we use 100% of our brain, and pictures show that. But to get things done, we might only use 15. We, to get something complicated done, we might only use 35. Otherwise, you wouldn't be an efficient animal or human in the savanna if you couldn't really control this important, but not having it in fifth gear all the time is an evolutionary strategy, in my opinion. So then it falls into rut, because efficiency is about ruts, like dominoes falling in a certain path. And the best way I can explain it is, as you grow, the brain, uh, the way the electricity flows, the way the connections uh, prioritize, is a bit like skiing down a mountain. It, it starts creating these electrical grooves of sort, where if you see something, you see a cliff, and every time you do that and you've reinforced it, it actually becomes less expensive energy-wise to follow and fall into that habit. So these pathways, these habits in our mind, these rituals, these things that are good for us, we want to hold on to those, but a lot of them have become deeply carved, you know, routes down the mountain. And filling those in, burying them, and finding healthier ones is going to be an energy expending process. The effort will be harder in the beginning, and then as you create a new route down the mountain, you can condition yourself to having more favorable and constructive responses. That's the best way I can explain is why effort will lead to change, and your most effort will be spent in the beginning, and then you can change your emotional and cognitive responses by conditioning yourself to find a different route down the mountain. Need motivation? Watch the top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because you are probably the most ambitious person in your circle, but you know you're capable of more, and you get that push by surrounding yourself with the best. So today, let's learn from one of the best, Rahul John Dial, and my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Rule number two, prevent sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation is unhealthy. On occasion, it's okay, but prolonged sleep deprivation is not good for you. It gives you diseases. For a short trip like this, I'm familiar with sleep deprivation. I did surgical training in, in the States <laughs> before, they, before they limited the hours to 88. And I mean, we were doing 40 hour shifts. Uh, for me, when I'm sleep deprived, uh, I become disinhibited, more candid, uh, a bit more jovial. I think that works for me during this trip. So I'm, uh, I'm okay with it. But for most people, they should understand that we, as well as plants, grew on a planet th that has a revolution. And so it's a diurnal basis of not just our sleep patterns, but the DNA in our tissue changes at night and during day. We're meant to cycle that way. And it's not from the pineal gland and melatonin that regulates it. It's actually from a suprachiasmatic nucleus. Yeah. It's a fancy term for a structure hanging down beneath your brain that you can access through your nose. And it is based on a 24-hour clock. And a recent Nobel Prize was given to it. So the getting into a rhythm of day and night is extremely important for your health. It is designed not in your, not just in your brain, but in the DNA readouts in your liver and your muscle and your intestines. So it's mind-body regulation that the sun and the setting sun and the rising sun does. Rule number three, get more vitamins. I'm not talking about being skinny or fat or heavy or obese or, or, or underweight. I'm not talking about any of those things. The things you eat, regardless of your weight, um, can help preserve the flesh of your brain. And that's the Mediterranean diet. So I would have added salmon a couple of times. And if you're vegan, um, mm -hmm. you, you could. there are vegetables that add that, that sort of omega-3s in there. Yeah. I would have said, look, this has to be a part of what you eat, even if you're eating french fries every day. Yeah, I'm not telling you what not to eat. Yeah. Right? So make sure you have this at least. This, yeah. yeah, this vitamin. This is nature's true vitamins, uh -huh. right, for your brain. I would have taught him that and, the, and, and sort of the emotional coping skills. Um, and now we've gone over why that's important, that for these things to work, they're a multi-decade, they're a glacial process. Yeah. It's not, can, what can we take tomorrow? Can I take this pill and it'll fix everything? If there was one, I'd be taking it, I'd share it with you. I'm not yeah, against yeah. it, actually. I just, there isn't one. And when you think of the brain and the ways we've tried to conceptualize them today, you can imagine one pill ain't gonna fix all of that. Uh -huh. um, the other thing that I find interesting is when they're born, they actually have more neurons than they hold on to. And that was one, you know, when you said in surgery, like there was an aha moment, I was like, can you do that? Well, in neuroscience, there was this one aha moment for me. It's like, they have more of those neurons, those jellyfish when they're young than when they're older. So 
you're born with the biggest block of marble. Wow. And you shave, you shave off what you don't use. Because the brain is an energy hog, right? So it wants to be efficient. So if you see that there will be a pruning of the diversity of neurons, mm. and then certain things will be, have better connections, and, and, re and stay in there. If you know there's a, a culling coming for, for the diversity of neurons, the, the most broad types of neurons, um, I think it's important to let them have the most broad types of life experiences. So they hold on to those as they get older and then they can choose what they want to do and shave off a few they ain't using anymore, right? Right. So that it's called pruning. Huh. Um, okay. The human brain in kids will go through pruning. And people are like, what does that mean? Well, you know, we're born and we can't walk and then we learn to walk. So some changes are going on. Uh -huh. well, the changes are also going on up here. You're born with a lot and you're shaving certain things down. Diversity of experiences, I think, uh, are very important. So I took them traveling with me all around the world, like each of them, eight trips to, eight trips around the world each. Wow. Um, and that's when we did all our vibing, bonding, talking, hanging. Of course, took them to all the practices and games and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, but the diversity of experiences was important to me. That, helps that could be with grandma, with cookies, yeah, yeah. different cookies. I'm not, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be all That helps prune the brain and optimize the brain. Yeah, so that helps. Um, a diversity of experiences will keep, will let them have the, the widest repertoire of mm -hmm. neurons. As opposed so, to what, limiting their experiences? Yeah, because then the brain will shave off the stuff it doesn't do. If you, if you tie one hand behind the back, certain neurons will, will, will fall away. So, so we want to keep those neurons as long as And that's can. my second point. I got a buddy who's an Olympian in, uh, in, um, uh, in England. He's a uh, pentathlete. Uh -huh. Greg White, and he, he made a great point. He's, I was I, the athlete in college. Oh, were you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just fascinating it was, to see. It was amazing, man. It's great. I like the. I'm, I've always tried to be sort of a, a decathlete in life. In life, like, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be. I want to enjoy. It's not that I want to be good at a lot of different things. I want to. I want to see what it looks like when yeah. you get to be good at. Yeah, things, exactly. You get into different worlds like this one. Right? But uh, the other thing is that. Um, proprioception, which should be cultivated in my mind, which is the knowing your arm is up or down. And so Greg and I, we talked about it. It would be fun for, everybody should play as much as to their capacity, because I know people have children with intellectual or physical disabilities, but similarly, getting them physically is teaching them how to do somersaults, mm -hmm. putting them in a, not that they're gonna be gymnasts, but. Handstands and backflips and, uh, yeah. But some sort of sporting, they call it sporting over there, like, you know, exposure uh -huh. so they're fully coordinated with their bodies i think that's an important whether that translates to less falls as grandma when they become grandparents i don't know but the the full integration of of brain to physical coordination i think would be an interesting one you know using the mouse with their left hand using the fork with their left hand forcing mm -hmm. forcing those uh, those neurons to stay relevant right? yes so that's uh, in experiences, and that's in, that, number two, I would say, in movement. And then number three is, uh, you know, what we talked about is teaching them what should be eaten. I, I think mm -hmm. it's easy to say, I had this conversation with one of my sons the other day. I was like, um, try to eat this regardless of what else you eat. Right. Um, because there are things in, in fatty fish, certain vegetables, and plants um, that's separate from the junk food, separate from all the other bad stuff you might eat or good. I mean, it's delicious, man. Happiness is important. I, I eat some, I eat some junk food, but I have tried hard since I learned about this to to be on the Mediterranean diet. Yeah, or to add to add plants and omega threes and wow. however you want to do uh -huh. that. Wow. Um, as uh, not to lose weight, not not for all of that, but to preserve the flesh of my brain. So I think you know. Uh, diversity of experiences to keep your your neurons around. Um, mm -hmm. Lots of movement and coordination training to keep uh, to keep those neurons engaged, and then um, um, eat plants. Yeah, to keep the flesh going. Rule number four: Eat for your brain. If you want to kick the mind diet into next gear, and you're thinking, I don't want to just stave off brain degeneration, right? Like, what if you wanted to work on focus and cognition? These things are harder to test. 
But when you go into the big neuroscience journals, they speak about intermittent fasting. And the best way I can explain it is your brain's a hybrid vehicle. It grew, it evolved through, through thousands and thousands and thousands of years of lots of food scarcity. You didn't eat all the time. And so it's got a backup mechanism called ketones. So after 16 hours, if you don't put glucose in and the liver's done releasing the glucose it's held onto through glycogen reserves, then it'll start burning fat. Mm. It'll clip off those oxygens and hydrogens and they'll make ketones out of it. Intermittent fasting can also help you lose weight. I think that's why most people are inter interested in it. But it's the way the brain prefers to get its fuel source. And it's based on a diet. Um, lessons about dieting learned through uh, controlling epilepsy and seizures in kids mm. in areas where there's no medicine. So I was in Ukraine and when they don't have medicine or a type of seizure, seizures, abnormal electrical activity of the brain, just like an arrhythmia would be an abnormal electrical activity of the heart. Uh, they would just feed them all fat diet. You could smell it in the hospitals. So something about an oh. all fat diet forcing you into just using ketones. Now intermittent fasting is back and forth, glucose and then ketones, glucose and then ketones. But for kids, if you just get them almost nearly all ketone as the source that goes up to the brain through an all fat diet, mm their seizure rates go down. You know, so that's proof that food changes mind because the mind is the electricity sparking through that flesh. Mm. Food will change the electricity, detectable, measurable det electricity in your brain. Food affects mind, food affects brain. With that premise, we can talk about, okay, mind diet will hold off dementia and intermittent fasting might make you feel like you've had a cup of coffee once you get in a rhythm out. It's not gonna make you smarter, but it'll bring you to your most focused, to bring you to your most attentive. It's not, gonna, oh, I'm intermittent fasting and now I can do physics. It's, it's, <laughs> it's not like that. It's your personal best. And then the habits you demonstrate to your family by trying to be at your personal best. And then your kids see that and your friends see that. And I think that's how you impact generation change is to have, uh, capable people demonstrate, hey, it's not hard, and this is the best we can do for ourselves. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number five, learn meditative breathing. The lessons we learn from athletes and ballerinas and other people apply to everybody. And so when we speak about what people can do uh, when they're stressed out, on an LA freeway, um, when they're about to go into a meeting with a boss and you're anticipating something not going well, when you're coming home and your relationship hasn't been good, the time-tested method and the one that we now know, see, I don't want to just tell you things without telling you how I know and why I have the privilege to even ask that question. To me, it's meditative breathing. It's a very powerful way to quell that anxiety storm that those instinctive structures have done. I'm going to see my boss and those subcortical structures are firing and they're unhappy. Much like you'd see a snake or you're at the edge of a cliff. There's certain things that should be released in your body, but those have been uh, repurposed in a negative, destructive way where we feel that at work. We feel that at home. We feel that when we look at certain social media. How do we tamp that down? Just like we would slowly walk away from a fear of heights how do we walk away from just the general anxiety that's filled our life during the day and i deeply uh believe and particularly now because there's hardcore data and i'll go into this a little bit is meditative breathing i don't know what mindfulness is i don't know what your mind is thinking or my mind is thinking or your mind is thinking but i know that that the brain is connected to the lungs and the heart through this thing called a wandering nerve it comes down and that that the brain can send signals down to your heart and Buddhist monks can slow down their heartbeat. I know when I put a little coil on there for people with epilepsy, kids with epilepsy, a vagal nerve stimulator, 
and we send electricity, the electricity can actually go upward into your brain wow. and quell epilepsy. Epilepsy seizures are an aberrant uh, electrical activity of your brain. Think of it as an arrhythmia of your heart is epilepsy of the brain. It's called a vagal nerve stimulator. It's been around for a while. Yeah. This is something you can look up right now. We put electrical coil on this nerve and it calms electricity. It's not even in the brain. But meditative breathing, deep breathing, an in, in a count of four to go in, a count of three, two, one to hold and a slow release. If you do that just a little bit before you engage in that next stress provoking task, it too works like a vagal nerve stimulator without us having to do a little surgery to calm the electricity in your brain. And you're saying, well, okay, that sounds, where did you get that? Well, well, you know, you know, meditation has been going on for a long time. We've seen Buddhist monks do certain things and others, deep divers are a great example of that. But we, we know this now because a study came out last year and children and young adults, and actually all people, if they have epilepsy, an aberrant electrical activity of the brain, arrhythmia of the brain, if usually it treats with medicine, sometimes they find a little nodule we cut out, it's usually not cancerous, but sometimes we don't know where it begins. And it's hard to know what to do without understanding the origin of it. So they come in and they, ha they have brain surgery. We make a big incision, we remove the skull, and we put a grid on the surface of the brain. It's not deep brain surgery, it's surface brain surgery. There is yep. a difference. And then the wires come out of their head and they have to stay in the hospital for a week. And that's recording them 24 seven, waiting to catch that, that, that firefly, that this origin of the seizure, where is it? Because then with radiation, you can zap it and you can cure them of it, okay? Wow. So it's meant to be therapeutic. But what are they doing for that week when they're just kicking back, getting bored? So in come all the neuroscientists from San Diego, the highest per capita is out there, actually on the ocean cliffs <laughs> of San Diego. They come in and say, hey, can we hang out with you? And the recording's going on. Wow. And they actually ask them, let's do certain tasks. And then they went through like meditative breathing with these patients and these kids and these young people, and they're watching the electricity change and get closer to that alpha wave, get closer to the calmer electrical signals in their brain after just deep, slow, deliberate breathing. And that's accessible to us all without having to pay for it. So yeah. that's that the great would, thing, it's free, right? Oh yeah, I mean, the book is not, is, is meant to be all the magical things that are right there. I mean, you could, when you pull into work before a big operation, I'll take a few minutes and just and just slowly breathe. Yeah. And you can find an app and it's a count of four in, hold for a couple, count of four out. And then what happens is you don't have to count as much. Um, it, it becomes a habit. It becomes a part of your routine. It's free. You don't have to do it for 30 minutes. You're not going to be walking on coals and all the exaggerated, people, uh, exaggerated things uh, people think about. It is a resource available to you that has been harnessed for, for millennia, and that now you have crazy brain surgeons yeah. providing you the electrical proof if you're a skeptical kind of person. To me, that's magic. Rule number six, build your resilience. I guess the first thing I would say is, you know, at this moment when, you, when you're when you talking to me, I've been in better psychological places in my life. I'm going through a difficult time. Interesting. Uh, that doesn't mean... I think everybody in this country is right. it's probably on that same right and through other boat. personal things and stuff yeah. like that and what what I what I like to do first of all is let's go to the concepts and again and that way we can back the back, back the story in it right like so yeah. resilience is a word I hear all the time and you know I just I, I struggle with that word a lot because I'm seeing it in pop magazines and stuff like that and I'm starting to see my patients and other people feel like Oh, I didn't deal well with that diagnosis. Uh, maybe I'm not resilient. No, that's not. A, that's that's. It's not meant to make you feel bad about yourself. Mm -hmm. First of all, but when I when I looked into that, I found that there were two types of resilience. From a, you know, engineering is just you know you take a stress or a strain and then you come back to your natural shape or your original. That, this is this is different psychologically. It's more about there's two types in my opinion, systemic resilience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're battle tested, you've gone through a lot, and now there's a new situation you're in. You come with a certain resiliency right. that you built through your life. You carry it with you, and that lets you handle what's coming your way. Mm -hmm. It does depend on what's coming your way. Mm -hmm. Did you get into a car accident, or did you lose a child? Mm -hmm. Very different. Mm -hmm. Then there's processive resilience. That's what you're going to bring to the fight that you don't even know yet. Mm -hmm. And that's those definitions leave us completely wide open to however we're coping right now. That's right. I get horrible news. I'm not doing well. Well, 
I'm developing and potentially growing from this. Through these narrows, through these struggles will come strength, right? Mm. And that, so then you don't have to feel bad that you're not doing well because this might be something that's very seismic in your life. Mm -hmm. Again, losing a loved one or maybe just psychologically the loss of a pet. I can't, I can't categorize what is stressful or not. It's an individual experience. But if you have, if you see, res, you know, being resilient is something you, one, carry, but also have the opportunity to demonstrate. To deploy, yeah. yeah to yeah. deploy. Then it's a more open and a topic, and it gives us a reason to keep trying to be better. Right. And what I've seen in my life is that, that it's not a linear trajectory we're on. There's seasons mm -hmm. of our life, of, mm -hmm. of dormancy, of darkness, of winters in our life, mm -hmm. or a flourishing. And mm -hmm. what, I, what I love about that way of thinking about it is that, w you know, wherever you are, there's something optimistic. And it actually follows what happens with neurons at the microscopic level. Mm -hmm. If you are under no stress, stem cells discovered here in San Diego by Rusty Gage, he showed you the human neural stem cells that we can actually sprout new brain cells. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but some. They go to smell and they go to memory, interestingly. The, that if you're under no stress, your brain won't spr sprout new neurons. <laughs> says, hey, I got it covered. Mm -hmm. If you're, it, it's dormant. If you're under a lot of stress, it shuts down too. Like, oh, I'm overwhelmed by this. Interesting. But a, a modest amount of manageable stress is the molecular cue for the little neural stem cells, little seeds to squirt out more neurons. And I think with that sort of thinking at the biological level, seeing your life more as seasons, mm -hmm. thinking of yourself as, you know, resilience is something you cultivate, you carry and cultivate, right? These, this way, I think people are both inspired and it's more accurate. That's great. That said, yeah. um, I think what people misunderstand about surgeons is that it's like auto shop or we always fix something the same way, you know, and what they also don't realize is in complex surgery, and a lot of knee transplants, you know, you put the metal in, you make the pilot holes. Yeah, I could see it gets like that, even sewing arteries in the heart. But in cancer surgery where the tumor is different shape and erodes and invades anatomy in different ways, there's a lot of judgment going on. Right. And I think that's the part surgeons don't get credit for. Like, maybe I've taken enough. If I go around this way, uh, maybe, maybe I, I use a smaller scissor over here in case there's a vessel. Nah, there's nothing mm -hmm. over there. I can save time and lower complications for patients by going fast here. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of judgment going on. So when you ask old timers, you know, veteran surgeons, they... Uh, will say, yeah, good hands is, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's fine. But I'll take somebody with above average hands and superb judgment. Mm -hmm. And I think surgeons don't get a lot of credit for that. In some of the cases that I've done, there are three allowable good roads forward. Right. And you choose you one, you choose got it in your one. head, and then the patient has a complication. Yeah. Rule number seven, balance your attention. There's two things going on in the mind. There's attention. But there can be too much attention. That's stress and anxiety. You're just too dialed in. You're thinking about it too much. For me, so the attention has to be there, but not too much. And a lot of people think, you know, that, that it's some special focus. But for somebody who's an elite athlete or an elite surgeon, the skill is actually not dialing up attention, but dialing down distractions. Yeah. And so there's things your brain is putting out to do. But there's also the things coming in, oh, the lights are on, or this moment matters, or if I win, or if I perform well, my career will advance. Those distractions can actually put your attention in a spiral. So when you look at the brains of people who are performing well, they're less frenetic. They're less chaotic. They're actually using less energy because they're letting habits and rituals and well-developed skill release itself just like imagination and performance it has to be released by trimming down the distractions so i think that's a nuance that people forget or don't fully appreciate is it's not that elite performers have greater focus mm -hmm. it's they have greater ability to not notice distraction rule number eight find ways to be stress-free i can't tell my cancer patients just Try not to stress out. Right. It's just, it's hollow. Yeah. It's shallow. It's rude, actually. Yeah. So I think there's too much of that advice going on. What I want to show people is how we're sort of designed. 
our natural inclinations, and then you come up with your approach. I'm telling you, hugging my, my, my son got a puppy in the pandemic. That, man, that's my <laughs> therapy dog. I didn't even understand the con. I hugged that animal. And you brought so much and peace and love. You just what, I'm telling you, my physiology changes. Calm, just ha. Uh-huh. Yeah, it just, so everybody's gotta have an individual approach to that. So here's the two things about emotions. There's, uh, we could cut out the thinking, just to put it coarsely, yes. we could cut out the thinking brain and, and you'll still be alive. You, if you somehow were able to take out that middle part of the brain, there is no life left. There's, the consciousness relies on, on emotions. Things, on emotions. Consciousness relies on I emotions. Think, yeah, because they, they spark through, right? Remember the branches? Uh-huh. Front to lobe, deeper, branching, intersecting the global waves of electricity. That's why there's something called deep brain stimulation. Just let me riff on this for Go a little for bit. Go for it. So, when we want people to not uh, wash their hands 150 times a day, or have Tourette's, or sometimes depression, or sometimes a drive for obesity, or certain tremors, we take a little catheter, and just the tip isn't covered in, in, in plastic, and we put it into the emotional... Come not, on, the limbic brain. The limbic brain. You stick it down through the top of the mushroom. It, what do you call it? The cortisol? Cort- cortical canopy, yeah. Cortical you canopy. Can punch, you can punch you through that. You can punch through that and it doesn't affect You guys can look it up. Deep brain stimulus, DBS. It's around for 40 years. Yeah, yeah. So but, you put it through. So those drives that, uh, like Tourette's, uh, depression. OCD, we, we don't tickle the cortical, the thought. You're not we just have, tapping it's the an top. Emotion, it's an emotional drive. Oh my gosh. So you're sticking it in through the middle of the brain and what happens? And then the tip with just a little pulse, like the brain's pacemaker, and it changes the electric. It's it's, no it's not it's not brand new. I understand, but, it, but it, so why would so it you work? Can, you can pulse the, the limbic brain. Mm-hmm. How long Just, do you do this for? Five minutes, an hour? What is this process? They, they wear it under their they wear they wear it under their uh, clavicle like you would a pa- like grandma with a pacemaker, Come grandpa. On. I'm so you keep it in all the time. Yeah, it's you were right here. <laughs> and what what do you do? I mean, do you just push it, a it, button when you're freaking out and it kind of relaxes you? Or so the waves on that lake. Yeah. If I also jumped in on the other side, uh-huh. when those waves come towards each other, sometimes they negate each other, right? Uh-huh. Similarly, the right electrical pulse can reset the electrical waves in your brain that we were talking about earlier. That's how deep brain stimulation has worked for 40 years. Rule number nine, practice repetition. By the way you breathe, mm. you can change the electricity in your mind. We've seen that with the people we put grids on. Like We have actual measurements now. But that's the, you know, what's the structure where you get the most out of repetition what is the perfect spot where uh, meditative breathing hits that sweet spot for people? And they'll increase it if it continues to benefit them. But the food, the breathing, sleep is a hard one, but to me, um, food, what we eat, and meditative breathing, I think are the most uh, graspable and measurable. Uh, the creativity stuff, the sleep stuff, uh, the exercise stuff is harder for people, uh, but the exercise stuff is, in its w- own way, the most important, if we could get back to that. Ooh, why? Keeps your brain arteries open, releases all these neurotrophic factors inside your brain. So not just the plumbing that irrigates the flesh of the brain. Tell me about but BDNF. Actually, yeah, they're nerve growth factors. They're all okay. neurotrophic factors. And the, whatever the, the for the, in this case, it would be abbreviations, GDNF, BDNF, NGF, it doesn't matter. They end with GF. <laughs> and growth factors. So it really is, I've heard your word miracle grow, but getting back to the garden uh, analogy, uh, to keep the flesh, we're going to get, you know, electricity is one thing. To keep the flesh healthy, uh, you have to irrigate it. And that has to do with your brain arteries. And since we already said it's not a, it's not a ball, you know, it's, these, uh, you know, these uh, jellyfish and they're moving and they're throbbing and they're pulsating and their tentacles are reaching out. There's a lot of space in between. Mm. And that extracellular space outside of the actual cells, outside of the neurons, outside of the jellyfish, if you will, it's not just water. There's chemicals floating around in there. Mm. Now, dopamine might be just from tentacle to tentacle, you know. Serotonin might be this way, but what's it? What's in all the stuff around all those billions and billions of neurons? They're growth factors, and minerals, and chemicals that the brain naturally has. But there's also a soup that these billions and billions of neurons are floating in. BDNF is a key component of that soup that helps regulate the health of each of those 
uh, jellyfish or neurons. And we can trigger more of that through yeah. exercise. Yeah, you exercise and it releases it, it showers itself. It's not like the thighs, thigh muscle sends <laughs> it up to the brain. The brain says, hey, I'm feeling good, this is good, I like this, I'm gonna create a new rut. I'm gonna remind you, you feel good when you run. The brain will shower itself with growth factors. Mm. There are growth factors. The brain says, hey, you know, the electrochemical balance is better with those. So I think that's where you get the runner's high. You know, it's not just adrenaline. It's not dopamine's a happy chemical. I'm jacked up, I'm on adrenaline. It's just such a complex ecosystem. And rather than feeling um, intimidated by that, to me, I just see opportunities on how people can you know, improve their lives. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is set boundaries in using technology. The phone thing is a very interesting conundrum. It is the way in which they engage the world, but it's also the way, in the, the, way the world can actually lead them to the wrong path. I mean, not just the phone, 13 reasons why it came out, there's a little bit of a spike in suicides. I don't know what to make of that. You know, I want them to know about it, but I didn't know what to make of that. We know what Facebook and politics that those rules weren't set right. So I love what you're saying about, the, listen, these devices aren't going anywhere. The television's not going anywhere. Rock and roll's not going anywhere. Drugs aren't going anywhere. But how do we structure some boundaries and constraints within those devices so people who uh, use them in a destructive manner uh, have some triggers? For example, gamblers, they don't ingest a drug, yet they do all kinds of, they can have an addiction that's equal to, equally yeah, yeah. addictive and destructive as cocaine, and they never put a chemical inside their body. So casinos have certain things with gamblers and rules, there's gambling hotlines, you start to put things in. I think for some of the kids that cannot manage and, and choose a healthy digital diet, or actually even a food diet, there should be some boundaries. Maybe, maybe the... Maybe what we did with supersize at McDonald's also needs to apply within Facebook and Instagram. And, you know, YouTube is now making a kid's channel because maybe it's not good to have kids channels and porn on the same thing. Yeah. So those constraints without being too stifling, because I, I tell my kids, I want to be allowed to make bad decisions. I don't want too many constraints. I just want to know the truth about them. And I think you've hit it perfectly. What's the way to let them have it, but set some boundaries up so they know when they're getting into dangerous terrain. The life at its depths also reveals its heights, meaning that people who are struggling can also demonstrate tremendous powers and strength and growth that they didn't know they had in them. And to witness that has been powerful. And the second thing I would say is um, that no triumph or tragedy is forever. And I have seen that in, in families going through very difficult stuff. And so if we see our lives and the moments in our lives as seasons, um, enjoy where you're at. And if you find yourself in a difficult place, you know, that too shall pass and there will be a new season after that. Uh, those are the lessons I've learned. Nobody wishes cancer upon somebody else or on, on you know. So it's not like... You know, it's not like this thing, like, it's not an opportunity. In, I don't want to ever present it that way. But those that have coped well, they invariably say, I wish I would have lived my, lived my life the way I am now after a cancer diagnosis. Oh, man. Like, I wish I would have lived my life having seen the finish line relatively. Because it changes how they live. And they're not sad. As a generalization, like I said, some have suffered. Many have suffered, but they, they wish that they would have made quality of life a priority throughout life, not after the cancer diagnosis. Mm. So something about seeing the finish line on the horizon makes people go, oh, I don't like that guy, I'm not going to see him much. Right. This is something I enjoy, I want to, you know, they get, they, get, they get after it. They get, to, they get to the business of living in the way they want to deep down inside but often have been encumbered by the, the weirdness of wow. interpersonal relationships society and, and career and society. Pressure and everything yeah. else. I mean, I've met over 10,000 people and opened over 3,000 skulls and the journey that comes from before and after. And I, that's what happened the last four or five years is I started to step back and say, wow, this is a masterclass in humanity. And I would say the, <clears throat> they do have a lot of regrets about time wasted. 
And part of our, um, you know, part of the things we measure for cancer dr uh, drugs and cancer treatments is quality of life. We don't really ask that if you're going to get a knee replacement, but if there's a cancer treatment, we ask that. I say most of them will simply say, I don't know why this phrase quality of life was only introduced to me after a cancer diagnosis. You know, they wish that they would have made quality of life a priority um, before uh, the finish line was brought within a few years in front of them. Now, they do it all in different ways. Some of them say, why am I worrying? Some of them, you know, the the material things, the encumbrances, the frustrations, a lot of times they go away. Certain people, they cut out of their lives that they always wanted to. I mean, there, it's a, it's an, there's an immediacy to focusing on what brings them joy and happiness while still taking care of tremendous responsibility, dealing with cancer centers and all of that. So when I see them do that, I, I think, you know, maybe that's the lesson for me. That's the gift they've given me that at 48 to not take, you know, not, not to take the time ahead of me for granted. Um, I, I know that's not a specific example, but I would say the lesson here uh, is that phrase quality of life is, is not uh, something we need to think about after we get sick, but really before we get sick. From all of this that you've been through, you've literally, once again, I, for me, it's fascinating being in those, you've seen people, not make it. You've seen people make insane recoveries. You've seen lives changed, I would guess, pretty often. What's the biggest thing that you've taken away from it? Like, how has it affected the way you live your life outside of the hospital? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I think the, the obvious answer people expect is, well, you, you know, you're a cancer surgeon. Yeah. Um, you must, you know, understand how li how precious life is and how randomly disease can strike. Um, I I I have take you know I have taken away that lesson also. Yeah. But the biggest lesson I've taken from all of this is that I could have been I could have been a very different person without my circumstances. So just let me let me layer that answer yeah, a little please, bit yeah. like i don't want any credit for what i've done mm -hmm. a lot of things went my way mm -hmm. i put work into it but i'm seeing that you know i was born to the right family yeah. like <laughs> this, i love this country yeah. you know like this gave me so much opportunity to where i could actually go to el salvador i can go to ukraine and do surgery so like as much as i'm talking about you know, there's, there's this guilt that comes for patients who are, you know, some of the cancer survivors, they feel like, well, you know, I you know, I didn't do well with my cancer. I'm not a cancer survivor. Like, there can be a weird feeling of others have survived and I haven't. Yeah. So my life is steerable, but I've realized I have to be very thankful for just the right set of yeah. opportunities, environment yeah. that I fell upon or were given to me. Yeah. That just the best you know, the best partner, Danielle, you know, best parents, yeah. got a great squad. Kids are just, oh my God. I mean, I like, you know, he, this, my older son is just, just like the most, uh, it, smart is not the right word. Cause it's not just about smart. It's like you see him and it's just like, it, it's just like this energy, this charisma, right? Yeah. So one force. And my wife and I were like, we didn't do that. People were like, oh my God, you guys are such good parents. We're yeah, like, no, nah, right? we don't take any credit for that. Yeah. And so I've learned that there's that balance. Like I'm steerable we get very thankful for my fortunate set of circumstances because yeah. a, lo a lot of people get these cancers and they don't, it just happens to them. Yeah. So it's that weird steer the components that I can and, you know, and endure and enjoy yeah. the luck that's fallen upon me. And that's that balance I'm always trying to deal with. Yeah. But the steerable thing is good. If I'm doing great because I've been lucky, steer myself into savoring it. Yeah. If something tough has happened in my life, steer myself into enduring it. Yeah. So I'm, st I'm still driving, but I'm adaptive. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my frontal lobes are driving my life this moment and, this, and tomorrow, but I'm adaptive to everything that's still happening in front of me. Yeah. And that keeps it from being simple, like mindfulness of dishwashing. And then, cause I think yeah. that hurts people to be like, 
What do you mean, man? I'm struggling right now. And these yeah. people are so happy on TV yeah. and on these websites. Yeah. For each individual brain, you are new every day. You are steering uh, through the triumphs and the tragedies. Yeah. You know, that's, I think that's, the bi that's a biological lesson. That, that's not like some... That's like that's actually what's happening inside. The yeah. electricity, the chemicals, the flesh is different every day. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you're different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration if you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. For 10 more amazing rules from Andrew Huberman, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. In fact, there's a much better way to maintain ongoing action toward a goal that also involves visualization, but it turns out it's not about visualizing success, it's about visualizing